Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this CSG webinar. I'm Sean Sloan, Senior Policy Analyst at the Council of State Governments in Lexington, Kentucky. As schools were for forced to close this spring due to the coronavirus pandemic, many school systems and higher ed institutions were forced to ramp up online education and course offerings to allow students to complete their school years, to keep them engaged with the education system, and ideally to allow them to not lose a step in their growth and development during what has been a challenging time for all of us. Uh, today, we're going to hear from three CSG private sector associates that have been at the forefront of providing resources for and otherwise helping to shape what this new era of remote learning looks like. AT&T has been involved in a number of different initiatives, including creating a fund to, to provide parents, students, and teachers the tools they need for at-home learning. They've also supported online learning resources through platforms like Khan Academy. ACT, the standardized testing company, while having to cancel tests this spring, has been working to survey students on their learning during the, the school closures. The company is also, uh, through its Work Ready Communities initiative, focused on uh, getting people back to work and ensuring they have the skills to be successful going forward. And WGU, Western Governors University, which has made online learning its business model, serving the modern non-traditional student looking to upgrade their skills for the 21st century workplace. Uh, WGU has been working to advise schools and traditional brick and mortar higher ed institutions over the last several months uh, that have had to move uh, course offerings online and uh, try to navigate what a reopening or partial reopening might look like this fall. That has given them a bird's eye view of the impacts the pandemic has had on students across the country. From AT&T, we have Scott Hogue, who is Director of Public Sector Channel Marketing. From ACT, we have Dr. Michelle Croft, a Principal Research Associate for State Partnerships, and Jason Jones, a Regional Manager for ACT's Work Ready Communities Initiative. And we are joined by Marnie Baker Stein, Provost and Chief Academic Officer at WGU. We're going to turn first to Scott Hogue from AT&T. Scott, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, we certainly are in a new era of learning. You know, our country is grappling with unprecedented challenge. And now more than ever before, connecting people with the resources they need to maintain a sense of normalcy is paramount. You know, for students and teachers, that means creating the best digital learning environment. And for families, that means simply staying connected to loved ones. So at the beginning of this situation, you know, we talked about how we're committed to standing alongside the communities where we live and work as we navigate through this trying time. And so we embarked on a number of initiatives working with several partners and others to help meet the need. So if you go to the next slide, I'll, I'll show you a picture of some of the initiatives that we have embarked upon to help meet this need. And so in March, we underwrote the State Education Technology Directors Association e-learning coalition, which began compiling and providing resources on e-learning for state education agencies and school districts at no cost. Next, at and created a $10 million fund called the Distance Learning and Family uh, Connections Fund. And this was to give parents and students and teachers the tools they need for at-home learning. And the fund also provides resources to maintain meaningful connections and bonding opportunities for those isolated from family and friends. Now, the first contribution from this fund went to, as you said earlier, Khan Academy. It was a $1 million contribution, and Google.org also had a $1 million uh, con uh, contribution. Um, you know, Khan Academy offers educational practice exercises, instructional videos, and a personalized learning dashboard that really empowers students to study at home. And they also offer free tools for teachers and parents to help them track their students' progress. If you're not familiar with Khan Academy, I encourage you to check out what they have to offer at khanacademy.org. So as we saw school closings across the country, we knew staying connected was more imperative than ever before and that moving the classroom into the home required students to have access to the internet. And that's not all. You know, students also need to ensure that connectivity supports important safety protocols like the Children's Internet Protection Act, also known as CIPA. And so that's why we created an offer for all of our public and private schools from K through 12 to colleges and universities, an offer that would provide unlimited wireless broadband connectivity 
with a SIPA compliant security solution at no cost for 60 days. We did this on new qualified data only activations to help students get the connectivity so that they could have continue their education in this new environment. You know, at and also committed $1.2 million from our distance learning and family connections fund to seven small businesses that are focused on distance learning solutions. And these companies are all female or minority led and founded. And they focus on reaching underserved communities specifically. Then, you know, as college student summer internships begin to fall through, we announced that and we announced the at t Summer Learning Academy, which is a free self-paced online learning certificate program. And it's powered by our award-winning at t University curriculum. So this unpaid externship, as we call it, is designed to support more than 100,000 students on the at t University platform. And our hope is that this program provides an environment where students can continue to grow and prepare for life after graduation. And ultimately, the goal is to help students obtain a certificate that meets some of their professional experience requirements. So for kids, younger kids across the country, summer camp is something that they look forward to all year long. You know, it's a time they connect with friends and they try new things and discover untapped talents and grow as individuals. Well, this summer, you know, we have reimagined what the summer at camp uh, experience would look like. And we introduced the at t Summer Camp, which features free activities, curated from a variety of nonprofits that engage kids in new learning skills. And kids will be able to cultivate their writing skills, code their own games, and submit videos to real works. And at t Summer Camp isn't just for kids. The whole family can enjoy the experience as every activity will be paired with a Warner Media show or a movie that brings the activity to life in an entertaining way. You know, um, there's several other uh, things that we have done along these lines that you can see on this timeline that I'm sharing. Why don't we go to the next slide for time and I'll tell you a little bit about kind of the way we view uh, how transforming education and e-learning uh, is so critical. You know, first we're looking at how do you assess the needs across K through 12 and higher ed and libraries and drive efficiencies across that entire student ecosystem. How do you identify, you know, where you have the student need from a network availability standpoint with you know wireless coverage, with Wi-Fi solutions, uh, we have a, a, a bus Wi-Fi solution that we've implemented. Uh, really gotten creative in terms of how we can serve students' needs. And then over the top of it all, how do you protect students while they're online from inappropriate content? Uh, content. And so we really moved from this immediate crisis from back in March, where everyone was trying to get their arms around what we were dealing with here to going from that into late March, March 27th, when the CARES Act was enacted. And there was money available from the government specifically for education in the Education Stabilization Fund, which provided about almost $31 billion for education. And then, you know, looking at the different collaboration tools that students can use now, um, as you mentioned earlier, you know, it's we've got to have tools that students can use to engage with their teachers and vice versa. And then how do you implement all of this um, in a safe way and that's broad and covers everyone? Next slide. So we really view this as an entire ecosystem. You know, we're looking at things and, and tools and, and that you know, we can use to leverage to communicate how um, cities communicate with their citizens, how teachers communicate with their schools. So things like mass notifications that can be sent out to communicate to the broader population. You know, broadband connectivity, with wireless broadband, hotspots, devices, and Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi on wheels, which is, uh, which is the school bus uh, or city bus solution that I mentioned earlier. Integrated security into all of that. And then how do you make it seamless so that the user, the students, and the teachers, and the parents all have a seamless experience? Next slide. Video intelligence. You know, there, this, this has caused us, I think, to look at different ways that we can use intelligence gained through video um, to help make us safer, uh, more effective in what we're doing. Video conferencing, which I mentioned a second ago, and more. So we certainly are in a new era of learning. Uh, there's a lot of great work that we've done already, but we know we have a long way to go, and we're working every day to serve the needs of students, uh, teachers, families, 
and um, communities statewide across the country. And so I'll hand it back over to you now for the next presenter. Well, thanks, Scott. Uh, so next, I want to uh, turn uh, to uh, Dr. Michelle Croft from ACT. Uh, she's been surveying students on their learning during the pandemic and has some preliminary findings to report. Michelle, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Sean, for the introduction and inviting me to participate. Um, first, I'd like to start with an overview of ACT's Student Voice Survey Project. So ACT regularly surveys students following a national test date to get a better understanding of their perspectives on a variety of topics. Um, for instance, we've previously asked students about technology access, um, dual enrollment courses, and safety in schools. The surveys are sent to students a few hours after they take the ACT on a national test date. Uh, next slide. The coronavirus survey was a little different because the April test date was canceled. So we decided to sample students who had registered for either the April or the June test date, and the survey was administered in late March. So in March, we asked students questions about technology access, the initial move to remote learning, and questions about basic needs such as food insecurity or impacts to employment. We received responses from approximately 13,000 students, and the results from the March survey were published in a series of blogs on the ECT website, um, and a report combining those posts will be released in the next month or so. For the June follow-up, we asked similar questions as in March, but we added some additional questions specifically about students' learning experience at the end of the school year. For the June survey, we received responses from about 7,800 students, and a little over 3,000 students re responded to both surveys, so both the March and the June. So today I'll talk a bit about results from both surveys, um, but as Sean mentioned, we're still in the process of analyzing the June survey data, so those results are still preliminary. Uh, next slide, please. So technology access. Um, before I go into more detail uh, about the findings, I'd like to acknowledge that, that this was an online survey, so it's likely to underreport the need for access. Um, however, the results are pretty consistent with a previous ACT report called the Digital Divide, which included a, a mailed paper survey as a quality check. So while we think the results are, are reasonable, um, but they're likely going to be an underestimate. So from the March survey, we found that the majority of students had access to at least one device. Um, students generally described their internet as okay or great, but we did have 14% that reported an unpredictable or a terrible internet connection. Um, and then whenever we looked at students who only had one device to work with, they were more likely to be African-American or Hispanic from rural or urban areas or first-generation college students. Um, and further, many of those students were also sharing a device with other family members, which may make it even more difficult to complete their schoolwork. So the, the figure that's on the screen here is from the June survey. And here we found that generally students had little problems with their computers or internet being so unreliable that they weren't able to complete coursework. But it was occasionally a problem for about 16 to 22% of the students. And more concerningly, there was about three to 4% who reported that they often had issues with their computer or internet reliability to the point that they were unable to complete their, their coursework. Um, so after the administration of the March survey, we were really encouraged to see so many state and district programs um, providing technology, both in terms of devices and internet to families. And those programs will likely need to be extended in the fall if schools um, or students are going to be participating remotely, uh, particularly since there were still students who had issues with their devices. Uh, next slide, please. So with learning, um, during the week of March 26, we had 89% of students reported uh, continuing in class-related work even when their schools were closed. Of those students, about 95% reported receiving at least some form of instruction um, from at least some of their teachers. 76% reported receiving online instructions, and there was about 15% who did receive printed instructional materials. So when we looked at the open-ended responses, it seemed like students really missed the, their access to informal, real-time teacher feedback, and they were wanting interactions from their teachers. Um, students expressed that without access to teacher feedback and intervention, um, learning new material was difficult, particularly in an online setting. So on the slide, I have a couple of the open-ended responses. 
Um, students also expressed that they weren't able to focus at home and felt less motivated, making learning new material um, that much more difficult. Next slide, please. So we also asked students about their um, how the, the closures impacted their academic preparedness for college. And um, not surprisingly, the majority of students are concerned that their preparedness for college will be negatively impacted. Um, what I found most interesting about this data, and this slide is limited to students who responded to both the March and the June surveys, is that student concern decreased from March to June. Um, and this may be because students recognized that everyone was in the same position, so they weren't necessarily as concerned about falling behind, at least relative to their own peers. Next slide. Students also reported decreases in effort um, in their classwork from March to June. So although in March, about 75% agreed that they were putting in as much effort into class-related work as they were at school, by June, that percent was down to 65%. Um, some of these issues related to effort may have been due to the structure of the remote program. Yeah, next slide, please. So this figure is based off of all of the June respondents. And we, we wanted to know um, what students thought they needed to be successful in online learning and what they actually had in terms of online learning. And there were a couple areas um, of discrepancy. So students said that they really needed materials to be clear, assignments to be manageable, and to receive feedback from teachers. The students um, wanted timely and specific feedback, which is consistent with those open-ended responses from March. Um, and then what they didn't need. Students didn't necessarily value collaborating with other, other students, either generally or through like an online discussion board. Um, so we think that some of this information can be useful as districts continue to plan their remote learning options for the fall. So just make the administrative aspects as easy as possible so students can concentrate on the actual learning and provide teachers, um, particularly for students in need of support. Um, as I mentioned earlier, these analyses from June are preliminary. We're hoping to look more in depth at the student responses based on different demographic characteristics. Um, also, the survey was a national sample, so we don't have state-specific information, um, but we'll hope, we're hoping that these findings will be useful to states as they consider their return to learn plans. So thank you for your time. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, Marty Baker-Stein from Western Governors University is with us as well. Uh, Marty, uh, online learning, uh, as we said, is, is the business model for WGU. And I know that uh, you all have been able to gain a somewhat unique perspective on the impacts of the pandemic on students across the country. Uh, what can you tell us about that and, and the lessons that WGU has been able to take away as far as what it all might mean for the future of online learning? Sure, thanks, and thanks for having me. Um, as a little background, WGU is a nonprofit competency-based university that was founded by a bipartisan group of 19 governors a little over 20 years ago, who saw the opportunity to use technology and competency-based education to expand access to higher education and better align with state workforce development needs. So today we serve over 123,000 full-time students and over 70% of those students are classified in one or more underserved categories. So that's what this um, slide is showing here. Um, the vast majority of our students are first gen, low income. Uh, we have a large population of students from rural areas that have low access to higher education in their, in their locations. Um, students of color, as well as active duty and military veterans. Uh, we offer flexible, relevant, high quality programs combined with student-centered instructional model that propels students toward completion and great jobs and opportunity. And so that's WGU, next slide. Um, as a full, uh, and next slide. <laughs> as a fully online university, um, we were ready for COVID in the sense that uh, we did not have to scramble uh, to put our classes online or prepare our faculty to do that work. However, um, we were impacted. Uh, our primary focus from start was the well-being of our students and 
because most of our students are working adults, we were able to track the impact on that learner population over the last couple of months in ways that were um, that were really powerful in terms of our model and have changed our way of thinking about our community of care and our student service ecosystem. So what you're seeing here is a picture of um, a COVID severity impacts across the United States with WGU students in each state. Um, this was a moment of time. And we have a team called our environmental barriers team whose job it is in any time to make sure that in the case of a disaster or um, a tornado or hurricane, a fire, uh, whatever it may be, um, that they are there to support our students uh, and our faculty in affected regions. They um, talk to our students and faculty, they rate the severity of the issue, they collect qualitative data on the issue itself, and then they are the clearinghouse for support services, which can range from anything from micro loans to um, uh, uh, hardware loans to um, helping students with internet access, uh, et cetera. So this is a picture of what we saw. And I like to say, you know, it was like tornadoes happening everywhere all at the same time with COVID. Um, next slide. So in order to understand impact qualitatively, uh, we used hashtags across our community of care. And by that, I mean our environmental barriers team, our program mentors, our course instructors, our student support services, uh, our study centers to record when a student was having a, a problem um, and help us to understand, well, what, what's the nature of that problem? And so we created a standard list of impact and intervention hashtags that were used by all of our face, student facing teams. And these started being entered in April 14th. Um, and they are entered and continuously entered as long as it is applicable, applicable for a, a student who's impacted. So next slide. So what we found is that there was a really interesting variation in student impacts based on college. So here we see our College of Business, uh, where we had 33% of our students uh, uh, who were impacted, our College of Health Professions, our Teachers College, and our College of IT. So we started to get a sense as we were tracking this data down, like where the hotspots within our learner populations were for students' impact, which also helped us to start investigating and solutioneering around how we're going to attend to those impacts. The next slide, please. Um, and the impact hashtags really helped in this regard as we started to get a sense of what the issues were that students were having. Uh, and that really helped us to drive decisions around interventions, policy changes to assist with uh, the moment that students were in, uh, as well as emergency funding uh, and emergency support with equipment or housing or et cetera. And you can see here from this slide that our number one um, reason for impact severity was family care. So our students who, again, are mainly working professionals, uh, many of whom are essential workers or frontline workers who could not work for home, um, were faced with kids coming home from um, elementary and high school and having to work with them uh, at home on their studies. Uh, and that was an incredible stressor. Uh, that really slowed our students down, but also created a number of problems for them uh, in their everyday lives. Uh, another big area of issue was with our essential and, and frontline workers, um, the amount of, of hours that they were needing to work and overtime hours that they were needing to work. And in the case of many of our frontline workers, we have a large um, RN to BSN program. It's one of the biggest in the country. Uh, those students who are working in hospitals and care centers were in many cases being moved out of their homes into temporary housing and lost access to internet and, um, and just private space to do their work. Next slide. So for us, we learned a lot about um, what it takes to respond at this scale 
to a disaster like COVID-19 that not only has an impact on public health and individual health, but was having an impact on every aspect of a person's well-being and stability. Uh, as we were doing this work, we understood that there weren't any cookie cutter approaches to assisting students and making sure that they were making the progress that they needed to make. Um, it was complicated and every student's set of issues was different and in a way unique and multifaceted. And it was clear to us as we tracked this that our most underserved communities were at at incredibly heightened risk uh, and really understanding as an institution, you know, how do we create a response that works for everybody, but how do we actually focus uh, our efforts specifically at those students who are most at risk when they are at risk just in time uh, became an effort that we needed to make that we did make. And from that, we're learning on we're learning about how we need to approach this work into the future, not only during times of COVID, but in every time. Um, the second thing we learned is that faculty and staff and our community of care were as impacted by COVID as our students were, um, both in the same ways, that is, everybody was dealing with their kids coming home. Um, many had spouses who lost their jobs. They had incredible income cuts. Um, there were many issues with their housing and their well-being in terms of financial well-being uh, and their sense of security in their communities. So they, they were experiencing what the students were experiencing, but they were also truly the front line of COVID. They were essential frontline workers and needed support to do that work and to do it well. And by support, I mean not only um, support in terms of technology and internet access, when we sort of saw um, internet access rolling across communities, when there was sort of so many people working from home and so many students working from home, they needed that kind of help, but they also needed emotional and psychological support in dealing with the the stories and the anxiety and the the issues that our students were bringing to them day after day after day um, it was exhausting um, and it 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 was important work for all of us to understand how they were going to deal with that as well as keeping up with the everyday work of being a mentor or an instructor or a writing center um, coach etc so for us while we've always been very supportive of our faculty and staff, the level of support that we needed to, to put out there in these times really taught us a lot about what they need generally um, and helped us to respond to COVID, but also put in place policies and practices that will serve us for the long time. The third thing I'd like to talk about is just, you know, building off of the work that AT&T is doing and AC, research that AC has out, ACT is, have, has out there, um, we are truly uh, interested in slash worried about this notion of hybrid models of, of education. We've been working across higher education as well as with certain large school districts on consulting around the move to online and the move to hybrid models of education. And we are concerned that in the rush, um, to get back to school in the fall of 2020 during COVID, that hybrid learning, which we, we believe is a truly powerful model, is being assessed as you know, online and online instruction and in-class instruction and collections of third-party support resources, all orchestrated by a single faculty member. Um, that is surely going to lead to an experience for students um, that is not powerful and engaging and that doesn't optimize for um, the digital, the promise of digital learning. Um, hybrid learning environments are well orchestrated experiences that optimize personalization for every student, as well as social and team based learning. And what we're seeing across the board is if for the fall, whether it is in K through 12 or whether it's in higher education is really not hybrid learning. It's, it's a scramble and has not had uh, the appropriate planning time or financial support to, to flourish 
Um, hybrid requires infrastructure and faculty staffing models to make it work. Uh, and we feel like until that planning and that investment is in place, um, students and faculty and the communities that those faculty serve are going to bear uh, the brunt um, of that lack. Um, finally, we do think this work that is going on in the long term is going to pay off. Um, if we get hybrid models right uh, in the future, whether it is this year or next year or the year after that, we believe the long-term implication of this change from a fully online line environment to a sort of digitally transformed hybrid environment is going to be very positive and align with the needs of the higher education learner demographic of the future, where we're seeing more students who are working full-time while they're going to school as well as the development of more sustainable and dynamic educational models that use both digital and face-to-face -face modalities to optimize the experience for students at greater scale and at lower cost. So, so thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Marty. Uh, last but not least, uh, in addition to thinking about how to best prepare our students uh, during a time when it's challenging to put them in the same room together. It's also important to think about getting folks into the workforce or back to work and uh, ensuring they have the skills to be successful in what we expect to be a dramatically different workforce than the one we were anticipating just a few months ago. Uh, Jason Jones is with us from ACT's Work Ready Communities Initiative. Jason, what, what can you tell us about how ACT is working on these issues? Sean, I really appreciate the chance to share with this panel and with the audience today. Certainly, workforce development and economic development systems are no stranger to local disasters, the disasters that you certainly kind of think are different than what we're dealing with now. But it is very helpful when you think about the non-traditional pathways that depend on near real-time fast-track education and then a very quick on-ramp to experiential learning. Uh, of course, this type of learning from the public workforce system is really positioned to serve families in need by leveraging the workforce system resources together with other solutions that are provided by community partners. So it's very helpful to kind of think about the experience of disasters and realizing that, of course, we're in a very unique disaster of a much larger scale. But it is helpful to frame what has worked before and how some of these solutions might be scaled up to deal with some of these national and, and global disasters of just really epic proportions. You can kind of see some of the differences there, not just the scale of the geography, Geography, but when you think about natural disasters uh, providing damage to infrastructure, these types of pandemics we're noticing are damaging systems and institutions uh, per se. And it's certainly an ongoing crisis. You know, we're sitting uh, in July now at, at this webinar uh, dealing with this stuff off and on since March. And uh, it's definitely an ongoing event where a lot of natural disasters that we've dealt with before certainly have a limited scope in terms of hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, fires, and the like. Uh, the the scope of collaboration is really different as well, and it's certainly taking some interesting turns on a national scale, but so many good things are happening, at least at state levels and local levels in terms of the collaboration. And what these local partners really have known from dealing with other disasters is very helpful in this process as well. Here's some of the challenges, though. We have some known variables of disasters, but some of the unknown is still coming at us at such a rapid pace, even several months into this pandemic. So we kind of look at the established best practices and, and ways to measure our effectiveness before uh, versus how we're actually doing really an entire reset and going back to square one, sometimes pretty often through this process. So to help equip local workforce ecosystems, as we kind of see on the next slide, we developed really a, a framework called ALIDA. It's Adapt, Lead, Engage, Deploy, and Analyze. And it's really the notion on the important role that local public private partnerships play in the workforce ecosystem with disaster recovery. Everyone has a role and the local roles really matter. So regardless of where you are in the level or the category sector of uh, the workforce ecosystem, there are ways to really engage in this type of uh, skills-based hiring for economic recovery. 
So I definitely acknowledge the synergy of the earlier panelists in terms of how the future arrived early for education and training. But as you think about the work-based learning role of disaster and economic recovery can really open doors to a lot of work-based learning with a lot of benefits to the individual, also benefits to local employers and the community as a whole. Uh, the outcomes of work-based learning are very measurable now and in disaster type of scenarios as well as you track additional investments in the community and think about the earning power of individuals that are off of unemployment and in some type of work activity, and then how they're advancing back to regular employment toward the end of a disaster as well. Really breaking down this particular model, it's based a lot on what we experienced in Missouri in the year 2011, when we were dealt with a number of flooding disasters, and then one of the worst tornadoes in uh, U.S. history that hit Joplin, Missouri, in the southwest corner of the state, where actually I came from as a workforce development board director before coming to ACT. But these types of disasters and, and what drove us in Joplin back in 2011 was really a threefold purpose of work-based learning and its role in disaster recovery. First of all, you need labor for the disaster relief in any of the humanitarian work sites. You can imagine these in scenarios that different locations have been through in the U.S. before. These might be debris removal activities after a tornado or a hurricane. It might be some of the provisions provided by the Small Business Administration for you know businesses that are needing to rebuild their infrastructure and the like. But what was great about this program is that we needed the resources in the community. We needed the debris removal. We needed the humanitarian support, which really has a big tie in to providing disaster relief and where we stand now in 2020. The next purpose was really having jobs for those individuals that are off on some type of layoff as their employer was affected, their work sites were closed. We can actually provide provide through this type of approach a longer term unemployed individuals and those affected by the disaster as well. So it's a way to keep them employed and, and keep their families with income coming in while this period of recovery was happening. And that's really what brings us to the third objective is really having workers, a workforce that was ready and able for those employers when they were going to reopen. What we really wanted to avoid in Missouri, and I think what regions and employers want to avoid now is losing aspects of their workforce or big chunks of the workforce based on individuals kind of losing hope in the labor market. Uh, you know, maybe they leave one sector and go to another. It's going to affect employers and communities in, in many ways. What ultimately we wanted to do was avoid the Katrina effect. And that was the notion of while waiting on housing to be rebuilt, waiting on jobs to come back, that we had a, a you know, very high risk of losing our population. So that was the strategy of the role of work-based learning. And when you really think about the employment and training continuum as a whole, the role that education plays that we've talked about in the earlier section of this webinar, and then connecting that last piece of the career pathway, if you will, and those are those on ramps with experiential learning, and then ultimately entering the job pathway. So we do need to think about the changes in skills that are going to be required. And as we go to the next slide, I want to take a look at how this applies in disaster recovery areas true through our work keys job profiling process. Now we talked about how we need these individuals and we need them to be skilled. So there are ways to think about occupations that are very quick, uh, simply by nature of you want to get them into the field and providing support. So these are some of the sample jobs related to disaster recovery. When you think about the great need for childcare and certainly the need for contact tracers as uh, how we would classify it from a occupational standpoint of the community health worker category. So by profiling the jobs and even the training outcomes, having these skills directly measured to the work keys instrument then allows us really to pinpoint what's needed to learn and perform the job. And then we have good ways to measure effectiveness because we have strong linkages in employers that utilize this type of skills-based hiring that they actually hang on to employers longer, they're more productive, and they typically follow other compliance issues like safety as well. And as we move to the next slide, I want to spend just a bit of time talking about the unbundling, if you will, of existing educational resources, which you've heard extensively so far on the call. Uh, 
by some really strong minds here in, in this thought leadership process. But the work case curriculum is certainly one of those linear design programs that can be unbundled in a way that can be very helpful to the types of disaster scenarios. For instance, in 2011 in Joplin, because we didn't have textbooks to open our schools in the fall, we actually depended on a, different, a number of different sources of online curriculum, including work keys, which in 2011 at the time was pretty monumental experiment for Joplin to undertake. We do have an example of how that's been unbundled and, and continues to provide learning activities to adult education students throughout Mississippi. We interviewed Brownwin Robertson of the Mississippi Community College Board and their Smart Start program on how that works as well. And one more piece that's very helpful as we continue on to the next slide. When we think about schools, agencies, work sites, and different locations reopening, our work keys research into these job activities, coupled with other uh, available pieces of research like contact risk, allows us to provide some really helpful insight to uh, agencies, schools, employers, and the like, just as we had mentioned. We need to see how we're adapting these work environments for the post-pandemic uh, post landscape, excuse me. This is a free resource and actually can be drilled down to the state level and to occupation specific data as well. But it's very useful as you're going to see the level of contact in each occupation. And again, as you're thinking about preparing individuals to enter those occupations on a rapid basis, looking at skill levels and, and profile jobs and curriculum and so forth, what types of preparation might they need or what types of challenges or roadblocks might you have in preparing individuals for those higher risk positions. So again, Sean, I really appreciate the opportunity to kind of share the tail end of this perspective, if you will, and, and that process of getting individuals from education to employment. Certainly, these natural disasters make it a difficult challenge, but there are ways to position disaster recovery and economic recovery through a skills-based hiring model that's going to benefit individuals, employers, and the community as a whole. Well, thanks, Jason, and, and thanks again to all our presenters. Um, we have some time for a few questions, and I wanted to ask a couple of, of questions about how what happened in the spring uh, perhaps informs what might happen this fall. And I'll throw it out. To, I'll throw this one out to all of our panelists. Uh, you know, in recent days and weeks, we've seen the Trump administration uh, demand that schools make an effort to reopen this fall, and even suggest they might cut funding for schools that don't. Uh, obviously, there are any number of economic and political and societal arguments to be made for getting kids back to school. But is that push also in part a recognition that the efforts at online learning and homeschooling this year have been unsuccessful? And, you know, if we think about what it means uh, for the future, whether it's a near term future in which uh, schools reopen this fall and immediately have to shut down due to an outbreak or a longer term future, in which we're dealing with another pandemic down the road, uh, what would it take for schools to be able to flip the switch and say, you know, for the next three months or, or the next semester, we're gonna move to completely online instruction and, and not miss a beat as far as uh, kids continuing their education. Uh, you know, Marnie, you talked about the challenges of putting together sort of a hybrid model when there's been a lack of planning time and staffing and, and investment put in place. Uh, but what you know, what's going to be needed as far as improving the quality of online education, keeping students better engaged, but also in terms of uh, addressing the broadband infrastructure needs, the equipment and personnel and planning needs, and dealing with the digital divide in this country uh, in order for us to be able to one day be able to just flip that switch. So I'll just start and then I think uh, uh, we can dive into the infrastructure issues. Uh, there is there is no flipping of a switch. I think we flipped the switch this spring, we're still flipping it into the fall and uh, it's not adequate. Uh, we need planning, uh, these, these hybrid environments that can go back and forth uh, between online and in-class and that also um, in normal times create this really wonderful synergistic digital and face-to-face -face environment that can really help schools with a lot of problems they're facing. That takes planning, that takes money, that takes training, that takes support. And in the case of WGU, in order to do it at the scale we're doing, that means even looking at how we do instructional staffing across K through 16 and understand that a single teacher uh, can't do it all. 
they can't teach the in-class as well as the hybrid component and the digital component, do all the curation of the supporting digital um, uh, content and experiences for students. Uh, we need to relook at how we support that kind of environment and then we need to invest in it, not only for disasters like COVID-19, but for the good of all of education into the future. So that's that's my my suggestion is that we take this seriously and we start looking in terms of our investment in schools and our staffing of skills and our structuring in schools, how we can support, support school leaders and teachers and faculty um, to move into the future. Well, what, what about what are anyone else's thoughts on on sort of the um, uh, the infrastructure aspect of this? And and uh, you know, it, did we see evidence, uh, significant evidence this this year of a a digital divide? And what is the ultimate uh, impact of that? And and what are the what are the solutions to to dealing with that? So this is Michelle. I think that we we did see a digital divide um, this, of the students that we surveyed, and as I mentioned, that was an underestimate. Um, not all had access to technology, or they were sharing their access with other other people in their household. Which, especially if a school is going with a synchronous model where everyone needs to be online at the same time, it's going to be incredibly problematic. Yeah. Um, Scott, with with AT and T, I I know that uh, you're not necessarily someone who is involved in in the the uh, broadband uh, reach uh, issue uh, specifically or anything like that. But you know, as we think about overcoming the digital divide or or the limitations of the broadband infrastructure, uh, this concept that that you were talking about of using uh, school buses or or uh, public buses as Wi-Fi on wheels is, is very interesting. Can you talk a little bit more about that and then you know what goes into uh, uh, pulling something like that off and and you know where where are those uh, put in place and everything? Yeah, I'd be glad to. So you know both schools and cities are are really implementing and looking at this concept. You know if you think about it kind of as a good, better, and best scenario. Um, you know, from a good standpoint, think about a school bus that takes meals to students. And while the student is getting their meal, you know, she can be connected to Wi-Fi that's being uh, broadcast from that bus. And she can download her assignment and submit her previous day's work while she's, you know, there at the bus, you know, getting her meal. Um, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a really good, you know, scenario, good solution that, you know, meets multiple needs. Then in, in terms of better, think about, you know, a bus that, that would go in and it would park in an event where, you know, folks are socially distanced um, and the bus could park at that event and broadcast a stronger signal that went further distant where students can, while they're being socially distanced, they, they're still able to connect to that signal and do their work, submit their assignments, uh, et cetera. And then the best is, you know, similar to the above that I just mentioned, but think about a signal that could, that could travel, you know, even up to 400 yards um, so that, you know, students who, again, are socially distanced had the ability to connect and, uh, and take care of their schoolwork, um, you know, all through the use of this, this Wi-Fi on wheels, as we call it. So it's just, it's a great example of a creative solution that has really emerged in light of the situation we find ourselves in, you know, all in an effort to care for the needs of the student, you know, and students across the country. Mm -hmm. uh, Michelle, uh, the New York Times uh, reported last month that uh, new research uh, suggests that, that by September, most students will have fallen behind where they would have been if they'd stayed in classrooms, with some losing the equivalent of a full school year's worth of academic gains and uh, that uh, racial and socio socioeconomic achievement gaps will most likely widen due to factors like the digital divide. What's to, to become of um, that generation of kids and, and will there be remedies available to help them catch up at some point? That's a really important issue. Um, I know Tennessee has an interesting program, the Tennessee Tutor Corps, to provide summer tutoring um, by paying college students to tutor students in grades K through six. Um, 
I know our local school district is also considering for the remote option, having the majority of the district be remote, but bringing in limited percentage of students who are higher risk of falling behind so that those kids can have that in-person instruction and, and remediation. So I think there's a lot of innovation that's, that's currently going on to try to address that. Um, for programs that will be completely remote, though, districts will, um, as we just talked about, really need to continue to outreach to families to provide technology access so that way everyone can access the, um, the instruction. But equally important, they're going to need to ensure that the instructional programs are engaging so that they, they reach all the students. Yeah. Uh, Marnie, when, when we spoke the other day, one of the things that uh, you had mentioned was that there's, you know, the, the folks that, that uh, you've been hearing from, uh, the WGU has been uh, consulting with and everything. There's some concern, uh, you know, uh, among higher ed institutions and, and folks about uh, in trying to bring students back uh, this fall, uh, sort of the added costs that, that uh, not only those institutions, but that uh, students will also face in, you know, trying to keep healthy and trying to keep folks distanced and, and all of that. What, what do those concerns look like and, and what do they tell us about sort of the future of, of physical college campuses uh, if the future turns out to be a, a hybrid virtual physical experience or, or uh, whatever? Sure. Uh, so what we're hearing is that, of course, colleges are really struggling with the decision, the model decision itself for the fall. Uh, in some cases, they've been mandated to go back. Uh, in other cases, that decision is theirs. They're dealing with faculty issues where faculty are concerned about coming back because of their, um, their own health status or their own concerns of exposure. Um, they are dealing with concerns around student learning and student perceptions of the rigor of the learning that's being provided in their online solution. So it's complicated uh, and it is a scramble because time is ticking, fall is upon us. Uh, so what, what, we're, what, we're, what many of the conversations have been focusing in on is, wow, you know, this is expensive. It's expensive to provide both face-to-face -face access as well as quality online access to both instruction as well as all the support services that students require when they go to college. So that's non-academic services, which we call the community of care. Uh, and of course it is, right? Because we've got the, the, the fully baked, fully blown online or on, on ground campus experience with all of the expense that comes with that infrastructure plus a digital infrastructure that many colleges frankly do not have to support high quality instruction as well as high quality fully digital services. It's additive, it's expensive, and it's not sustainable into the future. So as we've been working with people and talking through the decisions ahead, our emphasis has been digital education, hybrid education is the future. COVID or no COVID, and now is the time to start working on long-term digital transformation planning for your college. That includes both reimagined facilities planning to support hybrid environments, as well as digital infrastructure planning, as well as planning around the kinds of faculty models and service models and support models that will be needed to do that work and do it at scale. Um, and like I said earlier, we think if that long-term planning begins now, um, we can hang on in the next year or two, uh, but we should expect to see some really interesting transformative progress uh, in the model of higher education in the years to come that we believe is pedagogically incredibly rich, allows for colleges to serve um, non-traditional, quote unquote, non-traditional student profiles in a more flexible and powerful format, as well as get to more sustainable models uh, and scalable models for the future. But it's going to be a lot of work between here and there. Um, uh, we're excited to see it happen, but no one should expect that it's going to happen before fall. Yeah. Uh, Jason from from ACT, uh, you know the, the kids who graduated high school this year, uh, some of whom are uh, now college bound, uh, are going to face a, a very different uh, economy than the one that they thought they would just a few months ago. 
in fact, we, we may not know, you know how this economy is going to shake out and the businesses and industries that are going to survive and, until the, the pandemic is, is all the way in the rear view mirror. Uh, but how, how do you all begin and how, how do we begin to think about the, the, the kinds of skills uh, that they're likely to need and, and that other folks who have been out of work during this time are likely to need uh, to be part of this uh, future workforce that uh, may still be shifting beneath our feet as we speak. Certainly, Sean. It is impossible to hit a target that you can't see, and especially a target that's constantly moving like we're dealing with right now. But it's essential to know that the skills are changing as employers retool, and they often do so during economic downturns. It's very helpful to establish really what benchmarks are going to be in effect for the new skills and workforce communities doing that in partnership with their local employers for job tasks, and then talking to the educators for the curriculum outcomes, again, being able to link that back to a measurable way. I would say one of the big gaps though that was really exacerbated by the shutdown of the traditional bricks and mortar infrastructure is digital literacy. Individuals are not going to be able to participate in these modern systems of the pursuit of education and the pursuit of employment or the pursuit of private enterprise without uh, digital literacy barriers being removed. As employers are focusing on those job candidates though, what they're doing, Sean, is there a lot of employers are not necessarily doing those decisions based on what those candidates know now, but what they have the ability to gain and translate back into the workplace. And that's where the skills-based hiring model can be super helpful to very quickly deploy new interventions in employment and new interventions in education to raise skill levels, but to have a system that will at least measure that and, and respond in real time uh, will actually equip those local leaders of the workforce ecosystem to be able to provide that response and, and do so in a way that can be measured uh, productive and, and actually track to see how that benefited the community, employers, and individuals overall. Great. Um, Michelle from, from ACT, do you think uh, that the expectations for any uh, remote learning that goes on this fall are going to be higher uh, than they were in the spring? And is there evidence that uh, school districts recognize they'll have to do better in terms of trying to replicate the the in-school experience, uh, you know, after the spring, is there now a foundation to build upon? So I think schools weren't really prepared for the closures in the spring, and hopefully they've been able to take the summer to have the opportunity to reflect on what worked and what different didn't work. From our June survey data, we noticed that there were some schools that moved up their end date um, for the end of school. So I think that in those districts, they recognized that what they were doing wasn't effective. Um, so I think it's going to take some training and professional development to to try to improve the the experience for students this fall. Yeah. Um, what uh, this this is uh, for for anybody who wants to to talk about this, but uh, what, what do you think are the the greatest challenges uh, faced by by educators in trying to uh, run a digital classroom, or you talked about, uh, Mar Marnie, you talked about uh, sort of uh, doing both, uh, the, the hybrid model, uh, you know, the, the challenges that, that uh, folks, if they're charged with sort of both aspects of that, uh, and what, what resources do, uh, do educators specifically need, uh, what, what resources do they need to, to help them, uh, you know, sort of transition their sk skills uh, to the online model? So I will just say that, in my opinion, one of the biggest blockers that we need to knock down uh, to do hybrid and online models into the future across the education endeavor is this idea that individual teachers and faculty can somehow be trained and then do this and do it well by themselves. If you think about WGU's model, which is a scale model, we are very affordable, very low tuition. Um, but in our, in our model, in our operationalization of online learning, and we do have hybrid learning components as well, um, we had to totally rethink faculty and community of care and disaggregate that effort across multiple faculty roles and really take a team-based approach um, to executing online and hybrid models of education. That's the only way we can do it. It's complicated, it's dynamic, 
uh, it involves not only instruction and media and communication tools and new types of pedagogies and new types of classroom management and new types of assessments. It involves all of that. And so expecting that a teacher is going to do that and take care of their classroom and be responsible for other um, things like cleaning their classroom at the end of the day during COVID-19, that's, that's a stretch. So if we can, across education, understand that the future of education, it requires a team effort and that hybrid and online models are not something that can be created and maintained and enriched by individual faculty models, that we need a different approach. I think that's gonna be our biggest our biggest blocker and friction into the future as we try to figure this out. And, you know, this is Scott, I would, you mentioned, you know, resources and what, what, you know, solutions. I think that safety is going to be critical, whether the, you know, whether the students are on campus um, for part of the time uh, or working, you know, learning remote uh, some of the time. Protection both while the student is online, learning remote is critical and having a SIPA compliant solution, um, as well as if they are on campus and utilizing things like you know, thermal analytics, um, thermal imaging to check body temperature before allowing entry to see if someone's you know, temperature is uh, above a certain point. Um, so um, looking at you know, how we keep students safe both on campus, in the classroom, as well as while they're learning from home. Those are two critical elements, I think, as we move forward. Great, well, folks, we are just about out of time for uh, today's webinar. I wanna thank all of our guests uh, for joining us. This webinar is part of a series presented by the CSG Future of Work Task Force, which will issue a national report and policy recommendations in December. We look forward to future conversations on these and other issues. For CSG, I'm Sean Sloan in Lexington. Stay safe and be well, everybody. So long.